Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are today's top stories. Anonymous U.S. officials say Israel has carried out a strike in Iran after reports of explosions near a military base early this morning. The strike just hours after Iran's foreign minister threatened a swift and maximum level response to any retaliation for its attack on Israel last weekend. We look at how it could affect the U.S. An encampment of pro-Palestinian demonstrators at Columbia University ends in over 100 arrests and the suspension of a congresswoman's daughter. The U.S. vetoes a resolution calling for Palestine's membership in the United Nations. We take a look at that decision and America's role in the Security Council. The House Republican Conference is divided over Speaker Johnson's foreign aid plan. Luis Martinez brings us reactions from lawmakers for and against the latest proposal from Capitol Hill. The requisite 12 jurors have been selected in former President Trump's so-called hush money trial. What's next as Trump's first criminal trial gets underway? 60,000 Israelis remain displaced from their homes since Hezbollah began their attacks from inside Lebanon. Hear how some handle the uncertainties of being forced out of their homes for the last six months. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Today's Friday, April 19th, and we're starting with breaking news overnight. Iran state-controlled media reported multiple explosions near a military base where fighter jets are kept. Iran says it activated air defense systems in the Isfahan region and claims to have shot down three drones. Anonymous U.S. officials told multiple outlets that Israel carried out the attack after notifying the U.S. The official says the target was not nuclear. And we're stressing that no one has come out publicly yet to confirm this, and Israel hasn't taken responsibility. Another anonymous senior U.S. official told CNN the U.S. didn't endorse the Israeli response. Israel's military has not commented yet, and Iran has not identified the source of the attack. We reached out to the White House for comment and are waiting to hear back. The Pentagon told us it didn't have anything to offer at this time. The possible retaliation strike comes days after Iran launched over 300 drones and missiles at Israel last weekend and just hours after Iran's foreign minister threatened an immediate and maximum level response to any retaliation. Here's Nick Robertson, who was in Jerusalem last night. Iran controls the information flow um, inside the country and the internet is not ready available and Twitter is not ready available and um, you know a high speed uh, cellular network connection is not so ready for people the Iranian government controls that because they want to control the message and information whether it's about protests on the street or the explosions that may be happening in the country so the fact that we're only through the news channels that are sanctioned by the government of Iran hearing about explosions in one city or close to one city, Isfahan, um, is, only, is only, as far as we can tell at the moment, part of the picture of what we think may be happening. But it's going to take time for us to look at what we're here, look at the details we're getting, cross-reference on them and, and, tr and try to get some better clarity on them. Iran said it had suspended flights over several cities. Syrian state media says Israel hit air defense sites in southern Syria. Israel's military says it doesn't comment on reports from foreign states. The reported strikes came just hours after Iran threatened to respond swiftly to any Israeli attacks. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has more on what we know so far. And it will be regretful for them. The details have been planned by the armed forces of my country. Iran's foreign minister prior to Friday's strikes threatened an immediate and maximum level response should Israel retaliate to last weekend's missile and drone attack. He also warned Iran might revise its nuclear policies if Israel threatens its nuclear centers. The United Nations nuclear watchdog says there's been no damage to Iran's nuclear sites and is calling for restraint in the region. A retired U.S. Army major told CNN he believes Israel is sending a message that it's able to reach Iran's nuclear facilities. 
Delta, I think the why is they're telling Iran that if we wanted to, we could reach out and touch that if we had to. Israeli Member of Parliament Amit Halevi told NTD, the responsibility to prevent regional war lies with the whole Western world. I think the main goal, not only on Israel's shoulders, but the, the whole Western world, is to actually to take off the, this Iranian regime. Halevi says Iran's ideological vision isn't limited to only Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. It's regarding Paris and Rome and, the, and Washington. We are the small Satan. We are the small uh, uh, devil. The great devil is the United States of America. And I think it's about time that uh, the, the Western world will face the reality, will understand who is this enemy that we, we face. On Thursday, the U.S. slapped new sanctions on 16 people and two entities associated with Iran's drone program. The sanctions target executives of an engine manufacturer, companies that service drone engines, and people distributing drones to Iran's terror proxies. The Treasury Department says it's also punishing five companies tied to Iran's steel industry and three divisions of an Iranian automaker. The new sanctions were coordinated with European allies in an effort to degrade Iran's missile and drone program. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Joining us now for analysis is Brent Sadler. He is a research fellow for Naval Warfare and Advanced Technology at the Center for National Defense. Good morning, Brent. Good to see you. Now, first, what do we actually know about the scope of the strike and the damage? Or also, when do you think we will have a real sense of the damage? Well, so far, what reports have been made, and again, it's uh, kind of a mix of of anonymous government sources, both in Israel and also uh, social media reporting and, and I guess reporting from the scene from semi-official sources in Iran, that Isfahan uh, Air Base was attacked. That's a base where old American F-14 Tomcat fighter planes have been based. It's also home to a lot of the nuclear facilities and research centers, uh, central and key to Iran's nuclear weapons program. Uh, that those nuclear facilities, of course, were not attacked, and Iranian sources are, are confirming that they had not been damaged. Mm. But one thing has been coming out, and that's about nine separate targets at that air base seem to have been attacked. Now, it could have been the, the hangars, could have been support facilities, but the air base seems to have been the singular target. And it'll probably be today or tomorrow that we'll start to get some, some more information with daylight and with satellite coverage. Uh, commercial satellite coverage that might start to show or pull back the curtain. I see. Now, if this was actually an Israeli attack, how far would that bring us up the escalation letter? And is there still a possibility of de-escalation? Well, I'm not sure that this attack from the Israelis really matches, certainly not in scale, uh, what the Iranians did on Saturday last weekend. So uh, I think the de-escalation is already well underway. Uh, the, the leaders in Iran most certainly do not want to see this continue. Uh, they, ha they have a very precarious position domestically. The real threat to Israel is Hezbollah right now. Uh, Hamas is largely neutered, but they're not out of the fight. And so Israel's focus appears to be fixed on the near threats, the real dangerous ones. Ham Hezbollah, most importantly, with its thousands of ballistic missiles of various ranges and capability, arrayed against it. And, uh, and for some time now, Israeli forces, reserve forces, have been mustered towards the north, ostensibly for an incursion into southern Lebanon against Hezbollah. Mm. But what do you make of the fact, though, that the strike happened so close to Iran's nuclear facilities, but then it seemed to have missed? Yeah, I think the message is, is very clear to the Iranian military leadership, uh, more so than the political leadership. And that is, we have the technical capability, we have the capacity to attack and neutralize your nuclear facilities at, at a, as, a, as of choosing. And I think that's really the, uh, the key message, is that they are not beyond Israel's reach. Mm. Got it. So also most information that we have been getting was coming out of Iran, as you have mentioned. But it seems like Iran has been downplaying the attack. And why do you think that is, and what does it say about how Iran is planning to respond, or maybe not Iran, but maybe through its proxies as well? Yes, yeah, so this has been a proxy war and certainly preferred to be and remain a proxy war uh, on behalf of the mullahs in Tehran. Again, there are several groups. There's been lots of public dissent and 
agitation in the months leading up to October 7th. There were several large protests, um, even several, if you go back a year before, there were even national level protests. So even though the economy in Iran seems to be doing better, the Iranian people are not much better at all, and they have been growing ever restive against the, the regime. So I suspect this positive spin is just another effort of the Iranian uh, mullahs to try to play it off as not a threat. The regime is still strong and resilient when, in fact, it really isn't. So it's a bit of a bluster for a domestic audience. Right. So you were also mentioning earlier to just touch on um, what you just said about that de-escalation is likely underway. What should be the role in w the Western world here, such as the U.S.? How can they help uh, push this further forward to climb down the escalation ladder, basically? Well, I have to caution, it, we, we still are ahead of Passover. Uh, Friday prayers are ongoing. So until this weekend is over, there's still a danger, the high probability that there could be more attacks. And again, I think that largely is a, a matter of how the Iranians respond to this very limited strike on the behalf of the Israelis. Uh, what the rest of the Western world would, if they want to continue down a de-escalation ladder, they need to actually continue to support Israel very visibly and vocally uh, to basically make it clear to Tehran that there will be an ever-increasing cost if they continue down this path. Got it. Thank you so much, Brent Sadler, for your insights today. I appreciate it. We're going to bring in Secretary of State Anthony Blinken here. We have a live feed coming in. Uh, we heard clearly from Foreign Minister Kaleba uh, that it's imperative that in this moment, Ukraine get more resources that it needs to deal with the ongoing Russian aggression. It needs more air defenses. It needs more munitions. It needs more artillery. Allies and partners, including the G7 countries, are committed to delivering on that. Uh, we discussed steps to uh, provide more assistance more immediately to, uh, to Ukraine. We also discussed ways to protect and help restore its energy grid which Russia has sought to decimate. Uh, and here again, I think uh, we can see important steps that were already taken, uh, but more to come in making sure that Ukraine has sustainable energy for its people. We're also working to strengthen efforts to disrupt uh, the transfer of weapons and also inputs for Russia's defense industrial base. When it comes to weapons, what we've seen, of course, is North Korea and Iran primarily providing things to Russia. But when it comes to Russia's defense industrial base, the primary contributor in this moment to that is China. Uh, we see China sharing machine tools, semiconductors, other dual-use items that have helped Russia rebuild the defense industrial base that sanctions and export controls had done so much to degrade. Yes, and we see Secretary of State Antony Blinken here talking about how the U.S. is coordinating with its allies to bolster up Ukraine, specifically the Italian Prime Minister Maloney, who has worked with right. Biden, although they are politically different, they have come seen eye to eye on this issue here, whereas Prime Minister Maloney is opposed to actually having a direct military involvement in Ukraine, but supportive of bolstering Ukraine. That's right. And we, of course, see this coming ahead of a weekend vote of the House um, on the aid package here. And he again stressed the, how imperative it is that Ukraine should get more resources. Yes, and resources militarily, as well as bolstering up the Ukrainian economy and their ability to wage war themselves as well. That's exactly right. And we're going to move on to former President Trump's legal battles here. The required 12 jurors have been selected in Trump's so-called hush money case and his trial. Lawyers for the defense and the prosecution will search for alternates today before the trial begins. Here's the story. Uh, the case is ridiculous. Seven men and five women were selected from over 100 prospective jurors on Thursday. It was a mammoth task for the court given the high level of publicity former President Trump's first criminal trial has garnered. Roughly half of the first 196 jurors screened in heavily Democratic Manhattan were dismissed after saying they could not impartially assess Trump's guilt or innocence. Thursday got off to a rough start as two jurors who were selected earlier were removed. The judge dismissed a juror who said she felt intimidated that some personal information was made public. Justice Juan Mershon also excused another juror after prosecutors said he may not have disclosed prior brushes with the law. Lawyers question potential jurors extensively to find any biases that may compromise the trial. Several jurors stated that their personal politics were different from Trump's, but said they would not hesitate to return a not guilty verdict if the prosecution failed to prove its case. 
All that remains now is selecting five alternates in case any jurors are forced to drop out. If that goes quickly, opening arguments could start by Monday. One alternate was seated yesterday. Judge Mershon also said he would discuss with the prosecution what in Trump's legal history could be brought up if he chooses to testify. That's provided jury selection wraps up early. Trump exited the court at the end of the day with words of frustration about what he calls a sham trial. I'm supposed to be in New Hampshire. I'm supposed to be in Georgia. I'm supposed to be in North Carolina, South Carolina. I'm supposed to be in a lot of different places campaigning. But I've been here all day uh, on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. Trump is facing three other criminal cases in Washington, Georgia, and Florida. But the New York case is the only one certain to go to trial before the November election. Trump has pleaded not guilty in all four cases and has said that they are part of an effort to smear his presidential campaign. On the third day of his campaign trip in Pennsylvania, President Biden is receiving endorsements from the Kennedy family. That's as a third party wild card. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running a campaign that could tip the 2024 election to former President Trump. And today's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more from Philadelphia. Over a dozen members of the Kennedy family endorsed President Biden at his campaign event right here in Philadelphia. And that's a rebuke to one of their own, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And the independent candidate whom Biden's campaign worries could take votes away from President Biden and tip the 2024 elections toward former President Trump. Both Biden and Kerry Kennedy, one of RFK Jr.'s sisters, directing their fire not so much at RFK Jr. himself, but at the ultimate target, Trump. I can only imagine how Donald Trump's outrageous lies and behavior would have horrified my father. Daddy stood for equal justice, for human rights, and freedom from want and fear, just as President Biden does today. And President Biden again doubling down on portraying former President Trump as a threat to democracy, citing some comments by Trump that Trump said were often taken out of context. And as mentioned already, he promised to be a dictator on day one, his own words. And he calls for another bloodbath when he loses again. Meanwhile, RFK Jr. responded to his family's new endorsements for Biden, saying he's pleased to see it as it shows that people like he and his family can still be divided in opinions, but united in love for each other. He further used it to promote his campaign message of, quote, healing America. And Trump, meanwhile, has called RFK Jr. a radical left, citing his views on climate change and abortion. Still, so RFK Jr. is polling at 13 percent in a Fox News poll last month, proving that he can still be a threat to both candidates, or like himself put it earlier last month, that he wants his campaign to be a spoiler for both Biden and Trump. Reporting from Philadelphia, Iris Tao, NTD News. And we're watching the situation closely in Iran after reports of explosions near military base. We'll continue with our live coverage after the break. The U.S. vetoes a resolution calling for Palestine's membership in the United Nations. We take a look at that decision and America's role in the Security Council. An encampment of pro-Palestinian demonstrators at Columbia University ends in over 100 arrests and the suspension of a congresswoman's daughter. Anti-communist education coming to Florida. The governor says they will tell the truth about the evils of communism. The host of an education podcast elaborates on why students need to know this after the break. Welcome back. We're following breaking news on the possible Israel-Iran attack overnight. Australia is urging its citizens to leave Israel after the strikes. The government is warning of a high threat of military reprisals and terrorist attacks. The country's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has said on X the security situation in Israel could deteriorate quickly. Meanwhile, Britain's prime minister is calling for calm heads to prevail he said escalation is not in anyone's interest. Israel has not commented, and Iran has not identified the source of the attack. The U.K. says it's working with its allies to confirm details of the strike. The United States has blocked a resolution that would have recognized a Palestinian state. It used its veto yesterday at the United Nations Security Council. Here's more. The draft resolution recommended the state of Palestine be admitted to membership of the United Nations. The result of the vote 
is as follows. 12 votes in favour, one vote against, two abstentions. The draft resolution has not been adopted owing to the negative vote of a permanent member of the Council. The U.S. State Department said before the vote, an independent Palestinian state should be established through direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and not through U.N. action. It also questioned the Palestinian Authority's ability to effectively govern a Palestinian state. We've long called on the Palestinian Authority to undertake necessary reforms to establish uh, the attributes of readiness for statehood and note that um, Hamas, which is, as you all know, a terrorist organization, is currently exerting power and influence in Gaza, which would be an integral part of the envisioned state in this resolution. And for that reason, the United States uh, is voting no. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas said the U.S. veto was, quote, unfair, immoral, and unjustified, and defies the will of the international community. Israel's foreign minister praised the U.S. for blocking the resolution. He said recognizing a Palestinian state now would have been, quote, a reward for terrorism. Palestinians currently have non-member observer status, but an application to become a full U.N. member needs to be approved by the Security Council and then at least two-thirds of the General Assembly. The Palestinian push for full membership comes six months into the war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. More than 100 pro-Palestinian protesters were arrested yesterday at Columbia University in New York. NTD's Daniel Monahan has more in the incident, where New York police cleared an encampment set up by students demonstrating against Israel's actions in Gaza. Protesters were demanding a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and an end to U.S. military assistance for Israel. The encampment was organized by a student-led coalition of groups. Demonstrators shouted insults at the NYPD, equating them with the KKK. And chanted in unison in support of Palestine. Political activist Cornell West was on the scene. He told protesters he stands in solidarity with them and with human suffering. And I'm talking about the indescribable genocide of our precious Palestinians in Gaza. Yeah! Columbia University President Manu Shafiq said she authorized police to clear an encampment of dozens of tents set up by protesters on Wednesday morning. Shafiq came under fire a day earlier from Republicans at a House hearing on campus anti-Semitism. New York City Mayor Eric Adams said police made over 108 arrests. New Yorkers have every right to express their sorrow, but that heartbreak does not give you the right to harass others, to spread hate. Adams urged those who would protest to do so peacefully and respectfully. In this moment of heightened tension around the globe, we stand united against hate. The NYPD says protesters did not comply with police orders. After numerous warnings were given and attempts made to disperse the crowd, the individual still refused to leave. But no violence or injuries were reported. Columbia said it suspended some students who participated in the tent encampment. One of those suspended is Isra Hersey, the daughter of Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Separately on Thursday, about 500 demonstrators marched at the University of Southern California in support of Asna Tabassum, a Muslim student whose valid Victorian speech was canceled by the university due to what it called safety concerns. Tabassum and her supporters say the university sought to silence her because of her opposition to the Israeli operation in Gaza. Those in attendance yelled, let her speak. One demonstrator seemed to threaten the university, saying, we will silence you. This is the beginning of what USC is. USC is due for a facelift, and we are the top of the list. <laughs> FBI Director Christopher Wray said Wednesday that federal law enforcement is on alert for any potential threats to the U.S. Jewish community ahead of the start of the Passover holiday. The Anti-Defamation League tracked over 8,800 anti-Semitic incidents in the United States in 2023, the highest number of incidents reported since the organization began tracking data in 1979. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. In other education-related news, Florida is pushing to educate young minds in the history and dangers of communism. Governor DeSantis signed the anti-communist education bill into law on Wednesday. 
It will apply to the 2026-27 school year. We discussed this with Nick Zaveri, the co-host of Educate US Podcast. Nick, you're just the right person to talk to here. This law is going to teach students the facts about communism, including that 100 million people were victims of regimes from the Chinese Communist Party to that of communist Cuba to the Soviet Union. Please elaborate on why it's imperative for the youth of this country to grasp this. You know, it, it makes a lot of sense to have to have that to have a curriculum that sort of focuses on that. I'll be honest, though. I mean, knowing it's coming from the state of Florida, you know, there's a rebranding here because, you know, from the state that brought you book bans, right, we're, we're now focusing on anti-communism. So it's, you know, I, I struggle a little bit with where, you know, Florida's coming on. But that being said, there's a lot of merits to making sure that we're talking very honestly about the history of communism. Um, you know, some of the data that comes in tells us about, you know, the gen, you know, gen Z, millennials, people have a little more of a favorable view of communism. And I wonder if it's a case of like as an economic principle or as a form of government, um, because obviously there's a huge difference in understanding either one. So I understand where Florida is coming from, obviously, historically, you know, with the history of migrants, particularly Cubans in you know Miami, there's a lot of sensibility to that. Um, but I with considering that it's coming from the you know current governor of Florida, I do res I do reserve some concerns. And it is interesting you bring up the so-called book bans. Parents and activists have said that they're not banning books. They're simply just getting these over-sexualized books out of the public schools there. There's a Bay of Pigs survivor and a Vietnam veteran who joined Governor DeSantis at the signing. And the veteran said there are too many professors that are leftists teaching the wrong ideology to our students. Please go into detail about the harms of misrepresenting communism. Yes, and I, I would call I would call into question that comment in the sense of so I'm a college graduate. Um, I did have once a professor that pro that professed actually to to you know having socialist leanings and saying at the start of the class this is where I'm coming from. If you know that offends you, by all means you know withdraw from the class. Now I stayed around because I think the content of the class was important. So when we talk about you know this concern about. Um, you know what's being taught in what's being taught and that there's an agenda that's pro communism i would like to see some facts about that if there's a curriculum out there that's talking about let's focus on communism in the sense of from a positive standpoint uh you'll know, forgive me i apparently have a visitor here so um i'm very curious about that to me there is a little bit of a straw man to that argument now having said all that again i mentioned before about the data that's telling us that generation z and millennials seem to be more favorable now is that because of something they learn in college or is it because they're concerned about the challenges of unregulated capitalism and a growing wealth disparity in the United States, both of which, I mean, are documented fact. And that's not to say communism is a better response. That's foolish, of course. But it is to say that it is OK to question you know, current systems and look to how, how there's possible opportunities for improvement. Well, let's look at here. There's people fleeing communism, and you wonder why, right? People leaving Cuba to come to the United States to get better opportunity. And a little background here. Bay of Pigs was when the 1960s, when about 1,400 Cuban exiles attempted to overthrow the Fidel regime, apparently with the help of the CIA, so that they can get a, a non-communist state that would be friendly to the United States here. We are out of time, but it was good talking to you. Nick Zaveri, co-host of the Educate U.S. podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Going to break here, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas testifies before the Senate Homeland Security Committee just a day after the Senate rejected articles of impeachment against him. Meta, see. Welcome back. A bill that allows the federal government to collect data from foreign targets cleared a procedural vote in the Senate. Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is facing a Friday night reauthorization deadline before it expires. The test procedural vote passed 67 to 32, with members from both parties voting against it. It's unclear whether Section 702 will be renewed before the deadline. Under Section 702 of FISA, the government collects massive amounts of Internet and cell phone data on non-U.S. citizens living overseas. It also allows the government to access data of American citizens who may in, be in contact with these targets, to which Democratic and Republican critics object. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he was optimistic the Senate will pass the reauthorization bill before the deadline.
And Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was back in action on Capitol Hill yesterday, this just a day after the Senate rejected articles of impeachment against him. Here's the story. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas testified before the Senate Homeland Security Committee on Thursday. This, just a day after senators discovered that the alleged killer of nursing student Lakin Riley was released into the U.S. on parole after crossing the border illegally. So this is your policies in action, Mr. Secretary. A criminal is permitted into this country on grounds flatly not permitted, flatly contradictory to the statute. He commits a crime against a child and then he gets a work permit. He gets a work permit. The senator suggested the suspect never should have gotten the permit due to his history. Also saying that that's part of the reason why many Americans can't find a job. Then in February, he commits the heinous crime against Lake and Riley. Is this a record that you are proud of? Um, uh, Senator, um, you've misstated some facts. I have read from the parole file, which you have said you don't recall, don't have, you miscited. I'm reading from it. It is right here. Mayorkas appeared as a witness to answer questions about his department's budget request, but most Republicans focused on his handling of the southern border. Republicans argue that Mayorkas is a big reason why over 7 million people enter the U.S. illegally during the Biden administration so far. Democrats say that instead of impeaching Mayorkas, Republicans should have accepted a border bill which came out of the Senate. Uh, unfortunately, I have many colleagues who like to talk about solving a problem, but would much rather just throw rocks. It's just so much easier to throw rocks than actually solve the problem. The House is not picking that bill up. They argue it would only allocate more money to the border without actually changing the current situation. Turning now to social media, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg can breathe a sigh of relief. That's because he's been deemed not personally liable in social media addiction lawsuits, 25 of them combined into one. So what does this mean for social media companies and parents who may have kids that use these platforms? Here's my talk with Andrew Selipak, a social media professor at the University of Florida. I think a big concern is that now that Zuckerberg knows that he's not gonna be liable, that they're not gonna necessarily make many changes. If anything, we've seen Facebook, Meta, most of these tech companies kind of do the same thing again and again. They get called before the courts, they get called before Congress, they do a mea culpa, they explain the billions of dollars they're gonna to spend to make the platform safer, and then we just have more problems later on. Right, and the judge in this case was basically just saying if she were to rule and hold him liable, then any public figure would have to come out and talk about all the negative effects of whatever product or service that they're selling or promoting here. From an ethical standpoint, though, Professor Selpak, should Zuckerberg have been more forthcoming about the addictive nature of social media companies that he oversees? I think it would be helpful if he was, if the companies were, if all the tech companies were. I think it would be helpful if they explained the dangers to young people, to everyone, uh, because they know it. I mean, we've had plenty of whistleblowers who have explained and revealed how these companies are aware of the dangers these platforms have. And that would be great. I think it would be really helpful if they did more than just apologize for what happened, but actually were more proactive and explained, hey, you know, our platforms can be, not necessarily are, but can be very dangerous for these reasons and the impacts that they can have. Yeah, and in the plaintiff's argument, they said that Zuckerberg did describe some of the safety concerns with his company, but just didn't go far enough here. According to the NIH, about a quarter of adolescents are addicted to social media, and this can lead to reduced activity, physical activity, also poor performance at school, and even isolation and depression. So what should parents be aware of in light of all this? I think one of the biggest things is that parents who didn't grow up as an adolescent with social media that didn't have this constant sort of dopamine hit of, I've got to check, did I get a notification? Did someone comment on my stuff? Did they comment positively? Did they comment negatively? Did nobody comment? How do I look? How do think people think I appear? All of those things are huge stress factors that take away from doing a lot of other things, whether that is literal physical exercise, whether that is offline interactions with peers, with family members, with others, whether that's consuming news or valuable information, reading classic books, really engaging in life. 
uh, social media really distracts us from all the things that are of value of importance that we have held dear for as long as we have been sort of civilized creatures. Yeah, and just in a few seconds here, do you think that this ruling, letting Zuckerberg off the hook, is going to change the way that social media companies operate or even how they monetize? No. <laughs> yeah. No a difference. Moment, no. They, they recognize that, you know, with these lawsuits, until something really hits and really hurts the, the bottom line of these companies, and this was a great way for Zuckerberg to get off, all the CEOs of these companies to get off, knowing that they're not going to be held liable, um, they're not going to make changes until it really has a, a bigger impact than just one litigation case that they're found to not be liable for. I hear what you're saying. Well, Andrew Selpak, social media professor at the University of Florida, thank you. Thank you. Coming up, oil prices fluctuate as the conflict and tension in the Middle East grows. We have the details with the host of Business Matters. Welcome back. We are following breaking news on the possible Israel-Iran attack overnight. Iran state-controlled media reported multiple explosions near a military base this morning where fighter jets are kept. Iran says it activated air defense systems and claims to have shot down three drones. The UN nuclear watchdog says no Iranian nuclear sites were damaged. Anonymous U.S. officials told multiple outlets that Israel carried out the attack after notifying the U.S. Israel's military has not commented yet, and Iran has not identified the source of the attack. We reached out to the White House for comment and are waiting to hear back. The Pentagon told us it didn't have anything to offer at this time. And just now, Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke at the G7 in Italy today and said he would not speak on the strike on Iran and stated that the U.S. was not involved in any offensive operations. Blinken says he's focused on G7 efforts to de-escalate tensions. He did not confirm who was behind the attack. Here's Blinken on diplomatic efforts. Reports that uh, you've seen, um, I'm not going to speak to that, except to say that the United States has not been involved in any offensive operations. Uh, what we're focused on, what the G7 is focused on, and again, it's reflected in our statement and in our conversation, is our work to de-escalate uh, tensions. Um, to de-escalate from any potential conflict. Uh, you saw Israel on the receiving end of an unprecedented attack, um, but our focus has been on, of course, making sure that Israel can effectively defend itself, but also de-escalating tensions, uh, avoiding uh, conflict, uh, and that remains our focus. EU Chief Ursula von der Leyen and Italy's Foreign Minister both called for restraint after this morning's attack in Iran. And we'll keep you updated with the latest. That's right. And meanwhile, you can see that we have now Entities Business Matters host Don Ma with us. So we're switching to up, uh, topics and we're getting some updates from the economic world now. So Don, breaking news overnight. As anonymous U.S. officials say that Israel was behind the attack in Iran. How is this going to affect the United States economically? Well, uh, let's speak about oil first. So it looks like uh, uh, global shares eased on that. Uh, oil prices rose and U.S. bond yields fell as well behind uh, reports of the attack on Iran. It's the latest reminder of, you know, how Middle East events are casting a growing shadow over markets. Oil now prices uh, jumped $3 a barrel over concerns Middle East oil supplies could be disrupted. Mm -hmm. And later, uh, some of the gains were lost after Iran said... Uh, it has no plans for any immediate retaliation. Uh, the, uh, the MSCI All Country Stock Index was down. Developments uh, drove U.S. stock futures steadily lower with the Dow and Nasdaq futures down. Stock markets across Asia sank as well as appetite uh, you know, for risk. Uh, weakened, according to analysts, Japan and South Korea markets slid at 3%. Hong Kong and China stock markets both dropped. Uh, but gold futures were up in the morning uh, trade in Asia with investors piling into safe haven investments. And gold is one of them. Analysts from ANZ said today that the market has been on edge since Iran launched the attack on Israel over the weekend. Analysts uh, also said that Israel's response could determine whether oil supplies uh, are ultimately under threat, so we'll have to wait and see. Right. Seems like uh, some size of release, uh, reliefs everywhere when Iran reported no damage, especially to the nuclear sites. So um, let's talk about another 
possible threat, some um, difficult topics this morning. The FBI director said yesterday that the Chinese government linked hackers are preparing to attack critical U.S. infrastructure. Now tell us more about that. Yeah, a very serious warning yesterday uh, from the FBI di director, Christopher Wray. So what he's saying is Chinese hackers uh, have gotten into U.S. critical infrastructure and are simply just waiting for the right moment to deal a devastating blow. And an ongoing Chinese hacking campaign known as Volt Typhoon has successfully gained access to numerous American companies in telecommunications, as well as energy, water, and other critical sectors uh, with 23 pipeline operators targeted. Now, Ray said uh, in a speech at uh, Vanderbilt uh, University, uh, he, he said that China is developing the ability to physically uh, wreak havoc on our critical infrastructure at a time of its choosing. So very serious here. Uh, also adding that it plans to land low blows against civilian infrastructure to try to induce panic. Yeah, very deceptive here. Ray is also pointing out that the Chinese hackers, they use what are called botnets, these personal computers and servers scattered around the world to conceal their malign activities there. There's a new report by the House Select Committee on the Chinese Communist Party that just came out yesterday. It says, Wall Street put billions of dollars into blacklisted Chinese companies. What does that mean for Americans? Yeah, so it, it, me it means that Americans' retired money here is going to these uh, Chinese companies. So the congressional investigation found that Wall Street, uh, you know, put billions of dollars actually of uh, American retirement money uh, to buy shares in some index funds uh, that actually these uh, funds included blacklisted Chinese companies, uh, over five dozen of them in fact. The probe focused on the world's uh, largest asset manager BlackRock and index provider MSCI and the investigation found that American financial institutions funneled 6.5 billion dollars uh, last year to 63 Chinese companies that were actually blacklisted by the U.S. So BlackRock and MSCI did not immediately, immediately respond to media requests for comment. Right, just 3.7 billion by MSCI uh, alone. And so, yeah, now the panel actually calling for Congress to actually pass legislation that will restrict investment in those blacklisted entities. So let's see what will happen there. Thank you so much, Don Ma, host of Entities Business Matters. I appreciate it. Thank you. Stick around. 60,000 Israelis remain displaced from their homes since Hezbollah began their attacks from inside Lebanon. Here how some are handling the uncertainties of being forced out of their homes for the last six months. Thank you for staying with us. Many Israelis have been uprooted from their homes since October when the Hezbollah terrorist group began missile and drone attacks from Lebanon. For the displaced, this means uncertainty about education and employment and no clarity on when they can return home. NTD's Daniel Monahan has the story. There are an estimated 60 to 70,000 Israelis living uprooted lives since Hezbollah began attacks the day after the Hamas terrorist attacks on October 7th. Most of those forced to move from their homes in northern Israel expected the fighting to end quickly and to be gone only a short while. Being away from home for six months with two small children is very difficult. Um, my daughter has special needs. Uh, change is difficult for her unless she understands exactly why the change is happening. This mom is using the situation to teach her kids some useful life lessons. We're taking it as an opportunity to teach my children to be flexible in life. So it's definitely more of a curse than a gift, but I think if this is what we're having to deal with, I'm teaching my kids that it doesn't matter what you have that's material, it doesn't matter um, where you are, as long as you and yourself are happy and you are making yourself who you want to be, that's okay. The problem with returning home is not just the missiles that have so far killed at least 18 people, it's the danger of the Hezbollah terrorist group carrying out a similar attack to Hamas, whose gunmen burst into Israel, killing 1,200 people and taking hundreds more hostage. Israel's leaders are intent on pushing Hezbollah back from the border, 
But Israel's prime minister says force is not his first choice. I am required to bring them home, to bring them home. It's not just a civilian concern, it's a security concern. We want to create the incentive for security and the feeling of security, to allow this to happen. I say all the time we're going to take care of it. I prefer we do it diplomatically. If not, we'll do it by other means. Families remain hopeful despite the difficulties involved with their months-long displacement. Many homes and farms have been destroyed by guided anti-tank missiles launched from within Lebanon. The airstrike shelling and rockets have marked the worst fighting on the Israel-Lebanese front in almost two decades. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. That's just too long to be away from their homes. And according to the BBC, the cross-border fighting is intensifying, leaving fears of escalation here. Right, definitely this war has turned people's lives upside down. And has the world forgotten October 7th, Israel's 9-11? Kelly Wright traveled to Israel to speak to survivors and hostage family members. They vow to never forget as they combat anti-Semitism and fight for freedom. Watch Hope for Israel, an NTD News primetime special on Friday, April 26th at 10 p.m. Eastern here on NTD. Now, you please stay with us for just one minute while we head to a quick break. We'll be right back with more. NTD News, the fastest growing independent news source in America, bringing you breaking news from around the world, expert analysis, investigative reporting, and original award-winning documentaries. We're known for our uncensored China coverage you won't find anywhere else. We cover the stories that affect you and shape our world without the political noise. We report from the heart with you in mind. Watch us right here on NTD News. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Here are today's top stories. Anonymous, anonymous U.S. officials say Israel has carried out a strike in Iran after reports of explosions near a military base early this morning. This just hours after Iran's foreign minister threatened a swift and maximum level response to any retaliation for its attack on Israel last weekend. The U.S. vetoed a resolution calling for Palestine's membership in the United Nations. We take a look at that decision and America's role in the Security Council. The encampment of pro-Palestinian demonstrators at Columbia University ends in over 100 arrests and the suspension of a congresswoman's daughter. The requisite 12 jurors have been selected in former President Trump's so-called hush money trial. What's next as Trump's first criminal trial gets underway? The House Republican Conference is divided over Speaker Johnson's foreign aid plan. Luis Martinez brings us reactions from lawmakers for and against the latest proposal from Capitol Hill. The Hollywood Museum displayed some iconic costume jewelry from the golden age of Hollywood this week. We take a look at some of the dazzling work. This is NTD Good Morning. Live from our global headquarters, here are Evelyn Lee and Kevin Hogan. Welcome to NTD. Good morning. Today is Friday, April 19th, and we're starting with breaking news overnight. Iran state-controlled media reported multiple explosions near a military base where fighter jets are kept. Iran says it activated air defense systems in the Isfahan region and claims to have shot down three drones. Anonymous U.S. officials told multiple outlets that Israel carried out the attack after notifying the U.S. The official says the target was not nuclear. Secretary of State Antony Blinken speaking in Italy today would not confirm who was behind the attack. Israel hasn't taken responsibility or commented yet. Iran has not identified the source of the strike. We reached out to the White House for comment and are waiting to hear back. The Pentagon told us it didn't have anything to offer at this time. 
The possible retaliation strike comes days after Iran launched over 300 drones and missiles at Israel last weekend, and just hours after Iran's foreign minister threatened an immediate and maximum level response to any retaliation. Iran said it had suspended flights over several cities. Syrian state media says Israel hit air defense sites in southern Syria. Israel's military said it doesn't comment on foreign state media reports. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more on what we know so far. And it will be regretful for them that details have been planned by the armed forces of my country. Iran's foreign minister prior to Friday's strikes threatened an immediate and maximum level response should Israel retaliate to last weekend's missile and drone attack. He also warned Iran might revise its nuclear policies if Israel threatens its nuclear centers. The United Nations nuclear watchdog says there's been no damage to Iran's nuclear sites and is calling for restraint in the region. A retired U.S. Army major told CNN he believes Israel is sending a message that it's able to reach Iran's nuclear facilities. I think the why is they're telling Iran that if we wanted to, we could reach out and touch that if we had to. Israeli Member of Parliament Amit Halevi told NTD the responsibility to prevent regional war lies with the whole Western world. I think the main goal, not only on Israel's shoulders, but the, the whole Western world, is to actually to take off the, this Iranian regime. Halevi says Iran's ideological vision isn't limited to only Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. It's regarding Paris and Rome and, and Washington. We are the small Satan. We are the small uh, uh, devil. The great devil is the United States of America. And I think it's about time that uh, the, the Western world will face the reality, will understand who is this enemy that we, we face. On Thursday, the U.S. slapped new sanctions on 16 people and two entities associated with Iran's drone program. The sanctions target executives of an engine manufacturer, companies that service drone engines, and people distributing drones to Iran's terror proxies. The Treasury Department says it's also punishing five companies tied to Iran's steel industry and three divisions of an Iranian automaker. The new sanctions were coordinated with European allies in an effort to degrade Iran's missile and drone program. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Here with us now for an update on the apparent Israeli retaliation against Iran is Alex Trayman. He's the CEO and Jerusalem bureau chief for Jewish News Syndicate. This is extremely important news here. Thank you for being here, Alex. According to the Times of Israel, Iranian state media have issued a subdued response. And in conjunction with that, the outlet points to a statement by Jerusalem officials to claim Iran doesn't want war, even if it threatened Israel, if it retaliates. Will Iran risk war even after threatening Israel? I don't think there's any way to predict exactly what Iran is going to do. Uh, it's definitely a 4D chess match that's taking place now between Iran, Israel, and Western powers, including the United States. Uh, Israel did attack in such a way where they weave some ambiguity, even though everybody understands it does come from Israel. But it was not uh, Israeli F-35s using uh, airspace of Jordan and Saudi Arabia, for example, but rather uh, a glide bomb strike that took place from Israel. It originated from inside northern Iran, uh, hit deep inside Iran, uh, but did not uh, target the nuclear facilities, not target seen, uh, civilian uh, installations, and gives Iran the opportunity to uh, allow some ambiguity as to where the strike originated from, uh, what damage it did, and perhaps give them the opportunity to, to step down the ladder and not risk a, a regional escalation. Yes, that's exactly right. And here the scope of Israel's alleged retaliation reportedly appears to be limited. World leaders have put pressure on Israel and Iran to prevent a wider war. Have they been taking this into account? Uh, yes, I do think so. Uh, you know, Israel's been taking this into account, even though Israel is under an obligation, I believe, to restore deterrence. So let's not forget that this war uh, is being fought through Iranian proxies and Iranian proxies in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Syria, uh, in Iraq, in Yemen. And now Iran directly have all struck the state of Israel in the last several months and even in the last week. Uh, and so Israel has got to reestablish itself as a strong force here, has got to reestablish deterrence, but certainly mindful of a U.S. coalition, U.S.-led coalition that it hopes will establish very strong sanctions regime against Iran for what it did in its escalation. Okay, next, Alex, was the purpose of Israel's alleged strike specifically that it was so deep inside Iran? 
I think it sends a very strong message that uh, Israel can strike uh, anywhere it wants inside Iran. The uh, Air Force base that it hit uh, was very close to some of Iran's nuclear facilities. It's a signal that it can reach those facilities at any time. It's a signal that uh, the Mossad is operating deeply inside Iran, that it was able to conduct the strike that originated inside Iran is also a major embarrassment uh, and leaves uh, people guessing as to what other uh, installations, infrastructure Israel has inside Iran and where it could strike next. Can you give us an assessment of the media landscape, specifically what Iranian state media are categorizing this all as? Well, I think that the Iranian state media, which is an organ of the state and the Islamic regime itself, are trying to downplay uh, the uh, severity of the attacks. And I believe we don't really understand yet uh, what was the full severity of the attack. But if they're doing that, uh, it does indicate that that Iran is maybe not as likely to retaliate, uh, giving them an off route uh, for a, a regional es escalation. Well, it's great hearing your update this morning. Alex Trayman, the CEO and Jerusalem Bureau Chief for Jewish News Syndicate. Thank you for having me. The United States has blocked a resolution that would have recognized a Palestinian state. It used its veto yesterday at the United Nations Security Council. Here's more. The draft resolution recommended the state of Palestine be admitted to membership of the United Nations. The result of the vote is as follows. 12 votes in favor, one vote against, two abstentions. The draft resolution has not been adopted owing to the negative vote of a permanent member of the council. The U.S. State Department said before the vote, an independent Palestinian state should be established through direct negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, and not through U.N. action. It also questioned the Palestinian Authority's ability to effectively govern a Palestinian state. We've long called on the Palestinian Authority to undertake necessary reforms to establish uh, the attributes of readiness for statehood and note that um, Hamas, which is, as you all know, a terrorist organization, is currently exerting power and influence in Gaza, which would be an integral part of the envisioned state in this resolution. And for that reason, the United States uh, is voting no. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas said the U.S. veto was, quote, unfair, immoral, and unjustified, and defies the will of the international community. Israel's foreign minister praised the U.S. for blocking the resolution. He said recognizing a Palestinian state now would have been, quote, a reward for terrorism. Palestinians currently have non-member observer status, but an application to become a full U.N. member needs to be approved by the Security Council and then at least two-thirds of the General Assembly. The Palestinian push for full membership comes six months into the war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. More than 100 pro-Palestinian protesters were arrested yesterday at Columbia University in New York. And today's Daniel Monahan has more on the incident where New York police cleared an encampment set up by students demonstrating against Israel's actions in Gaza. Protesters were demanding a permanent ceasefire in Gaza and an end to U.S. military assistance for Israel. The encampment was organized by a student-led coalition of groups. Demonstrators shouted insults at the NYPD, equating them with the KKK. And chanted in unison in support of Palestine. Political activist Cornell West was on the scene. He told protesters he stands in solidarity with them and with human suffering. And I'm talking about the indescribable genocide of our precious Palestinians in Gaza. Yeah! Columbia University President Manu Shafiq said she authorized police to clear an encampment of dozens of tents set up by protesters on Wednesday morning. Shafiq came under fire a day earlier from Republicans at a House hearing on campus anti-Semitism. New York City Mayor Eric Adams said police made over 108 arrests. New Yorkers have every right to express their sorrow, but that heartbreak does not give you the right to harass others, to spread hate. Adams urged those who would protest to do so peacefully and respectfully. In this moment of heightened tension around the globe, we stand united against hate. The NYPD says protesters did not comply with police orders. After numerous warnings were given and attempts made to disperse the crowd, the individuals still refused to leave. But no violence or injuries were reported. 
Columbia said it suspended some students who participated in the tent encampment. One of those suspended is Isra Hersey, the daughter of Congresswoman Ilhan Omar. Separately on Thursday, about 500 demonstrators marched at the University of Southern California in support of Asna Tabassum, a Muslim student whose valid Victorian speech was canceled by the university due to what it called safety concerns. Tabassum and her supporters say the university sought to silence her because of her opposition to the Israeli operation in Gaza. Those in attendance yelled, let her speak. One demonstrator seemed to threaten the university, saying, we will silence you. This is the beginning of what USC is. USC is due for a facelift, and we are the top of the list. <laughs> FBI Director Christopher Wray said Wednesday that federal law enforcement is on alert for any potential threats to the U.S. Jewish community ahead of the start of the Passover holiday. The Anti-Defamation League tracked over 8,800 anti-Semitic incidents in the United States in 2023, the highest number of incidents reported since the organization began tracking data in 1979. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. The required 12 jurors have been selected in former President Trump's so-called hush money trial. Lawyers for the defense and the prosecution will search for alternates today before the trial begins. Here's the story. Uh, the case is ridiculous. Seven men and five women were selected from over a hundred prospective jurors on Thursday. It was a mammoth task for the court given the high level of publicity former President Trump's first criminal trial has garnered. Roughly half of the first 196 jurors screened in heavily Democratic Manhattan were dismissed after saying they could not impartially assess Trump's guilt or innocence. Thursday got off to a rough start as two jurors who were selected earlier were removed. The judge dismissed a juror who said she felt intimidated that some personal information was made public. Justice Juan Mershon also excused another juror after prosecutors said he may not have disclosed prior brushes with the law. Lawyers questioned potential jurors extensively to find any biases that may compromise the trial. Several jurors stated that their personal politics were different from Trump's, but said they would not hesitate to return a not guilty verdict if the prosecution failed to prove its case. All that remains now is selecting five alternates in case any jurors are forced to drop out. If that goes quickly, opening arguments could start by Monday. One alternate was seated yesterday. Judge Mershon also said he would discuss with the prosecution what in Trump's legal history could be brought up if he chooses to testify. That's provided jury selection wraps up early. Trump exited the court at the end of the day with words of frustration about what he calls a sham trial. Supposed to be in New Hampshire? I'm supposed to be in Georgia, I'm supposed to be in North Carolina, South Carolina, I'm supposed to be in a lot of different places campaigning, but I've been here all day uh, on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. Trump is facing three other criminal cases in Washington, Georgia, and Florida, but the New York case is the only one certain to go to trial before the November election. Trump has pleaded not guilty in all four cases and has said that they are part of an effort to smear his presidential campaign. Coming up, the House Republican Conference is divided over Speaker Johnson's foreign aid plan. Luis Martinez brings us reactions from lawmakers for and against the latest proposal from Capitol Hill. The Hollywood Museum displayed some iconic costume jewelry from the golden age of Hollywood this week. We take a look at some of the dazzling work coming up. Welcome back. House Republicans are divided over House Speaker Mike Johnson's foreign aid plan with a vote expected as soon as this Saturday. Our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez brings us the latest. It's been over 60 days since the Senate approved its $95 billion supplemental aid package for Israel, Taiwan and Ukraine. Since then, House Republican leaders had drawn a line that they would not consider any foreign aid unless border security was addressed first. Now, Speaker Johnson is under fire for presenting a foreign aid package without border security provisions. Uh, so I'm disappointed that we're not put in border security. It's a huge problem. 
Are you, you going to vote in favor of Ukraine aid? I don't sure yet. It depends what is going to end up. I support only lethal aid. I spoke with Congressman Eric Burleson, the Republican from Missouri, and he said he would not support the speaker's plan unless H.R. 2, the border security bill that passed the House of Representatives last year, is included in the package. House Resolution 2 or H.R. 2, if that bill was fully on the Ukraine supplemental, I would consider it. The American people deserve to know where, where their lawmakers stand, where their senators stand when it comes to their position on the border. Some House Republicans, like Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene or Congressman Tom Massey, have asked the Speaker to either resign or face a motion to vacate. Others, like Representative Van Orden or Representative Mike Waltz, have defended the Speaker on strategic grounds. The obstructionist, the minority of the minority of the Republican Party, better pay attention because we're over it. We are done. We came here to govern. We came here to legislate. A lot of those folks came here to get on television. Now is the absolute wrong time to send the House into chaos. Right. Some Freedom Caucus members have also rejected the idea of increasing the threshold needed to activate a motion to vacate the speakership. Currently, only one congressman is needed to activate a motion to oust Speaker Johnson. I'm opposed to that. The speaker serves at the pleasure of the membership. A strong, confident leader is not concerned about being in that position. Speaker Johnson has already expressed that he expects support from Democrats in order to move his plan forward. I don't have all my Republicans who agree on that rule, and that means the only way to get a rule on the floor is that it requires a couple of Democrats. It is expected that the House of Representatives will vote on four standalone legislations this Saturday. A bill for Ukraine, a bill for Israel, a bill for Taiwan, and a fourth bill containing Republican priorities. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. Yeah, House conservatives are really angry, not only at the prospect of sending aid to Ukraine, but also on that potential for a rule change to be made on how to vacate the speaker, right. which Johnson said he wasn't going to make that rule change or try to, but he has talked about it needing to be changed. Right. And of course, he's dealing with such a razor thin margin of Republicans there. But, you know, even Democrats have now stepped forward and said that if that would trigger a motion to vacate, they would possibly step in and help him out. And even Trump has kind of nodded at Johnson with a little bit of, with a hint of support, saying that although he gets along with both um, Green and Johnson, um, he thinks it's unfortunate if they would actually do that step since they have bigger problems at the moment. That's in Trump's words. Seeing a little un un unconventional yeah. the, um, bipartisanship happening here. Exactly, right. Yeah. All right, but let's move away from politics now because history made this week as a collection of costume jewelry worn by Hollywood's biggest stars was on public view for the first time. Some of the pieces on display were worn by legends such as Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Tabor, Bette Davis and Clark Gable. Let's take a look. The Hollywood Museum threw its doors open to the public this week with a brilliant display of costume jewelry featured in movies from Hollywood's golden era. The general public and today's stars are excited about their first chance to see the exhibits up close and personal. The jewelry represents something different to each person. It's class, it's elegance, it's stunning beauty, natural beauty. Um, yeah, I miss that stuff a lot. It's iconic because it's a part of Hollywood that, to some degree, we never want to be left behind. It's something that we, we, we cherish. It's a part of our life that brings us back to a memory of things that we don't see very often. And it means a lot, particularly for, for us to come to see these things. And we don't see them uh, enough, and we don't see them anymore. And this is one of the few places, not only in Hollywood, but in entertainment, where we're able to see a part of the most important past in our history, and that's television. The exhibition features the work of legendary Joseph of Hollywood Jewelries. The firm, founded by Eugene Joseph, was famous for creating costume jewelry during the 1930s and 1940s. Creating each piece involves a lot of painstaking handwork. Individually, all the pieces are assembled, and then uh, depending on whether the, what the base metal is, it could be plated either gold or silver, and then set in, you know, what we would call brilliance or diamante, uh, faux rubies, sapphires. At one time, we actually used a lot of white sapphires and white topaz in the jewelry. There are other costume jewelry companies. What sets Joseph apart from the others? 
Um, I think one of the things is his matte metal finish. He originally created a matte tone gold that wouldn't glare with the bright film uh, film lights that they had before there were light filters for film. And the thing is, is that having a gold tone like that makes it more wearable. And so you can bring that into your everyday life and you can have a big, bold piece without having it overwhelm you. The exhibition includes pieces worn in movies such as Cleopatra, Gilda, Gone with the Wind, and The Wizard of Oz. The company still designs and creates pieces for both Hollywood and the general public. You have a lot of curve appeal. Yeah, and I think I learned something new today, that a matte finish so it doesn't have the glare in the film. That's really interesting. I had no clue. Wow, my mind is totally blown <laughs> right now. I'm just trying to yeah. gather all this so that I can maybe put it to use someday if ever. <laughs> you know, maybe, you, you got to give gifts, you got to, you know, you got to think. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> right. You got to think it through well. Yeah. All right. But you know, Eugene Joseph was the premier costume juror back then, so I think he himself is an icon. It's great that it's out there now in a museum. Wow, yeah, and Gone with the Wind. I mean, these are some big titles that we're talking mm -hmm. about here. That's probably going to add to a little bit of their charm and luster. Yeah, so Max Factor Building in LA, of course, if anybody's interested. We're here uh, to wrap up our show now, but be sure to stay tuned for Entity's News Today broadcast at 10 a.m. Eastern Time coming up. And for Round the Clock original news coverage, visit us at NTD.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan.